attempt to uh, sum up. Um, what I want to do is talk a little bit about some of the key themes that have come out of today's um, discussion, which has been really helpful and really interesting to get the different perspectives of people um, around the room and the different tables that you've been on. Um, and then uh, Kate's going to talk a little bit about uh, next steps and some of the ideas we've got about where we may take this. Um, to start with, though, I'd just like to sort of slightly take a step back and remind ourselves that we're in an incredibly fortunate position. We have huge public interest in what we do. Um, and sometimes we get a bit anal about uh, thinking about what we're doing and we get a bit sort of focused on the problems and the details. Many other disciplines, many other professions would kill to have the level of public interest that we have. Um, and the, the, the enthusiasm to actually get involved in what we do and be archaeologists. Um, there are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not more, people across the country who want to get involved and be archaeologists, um, whether they're paid or unpaid. Um, and that brings huge opportunities. And sometimes I think we miss those opportunities. And one of the things I think has come out of some of the discussion today is that by working together, even for God's sake involving academics occasionally, um, well, you know, out on a limb there, I know, but you know, um, we may actually get added value, added benefits by that collaboration. And we shouldn't be worried about that collaboration. We should embrace it and think about where the opportunities are. Now, as we've heard in some of the discussions earlier on, there are funding opportunities to help support some of this. There are the obvious channels, which sometimes lead us into temptation um, and difficulties. And the HLF has come up a number of times. And I think it's unfortunate that sometimes when we talk about community archaeology, it almost becomes synonymous with HLF-funded projects, which are finite. Um, and that leads us to all sorts of concerns about sustainability. Um, and one of the things that I think we all acknowledge is if we're going to do good public engagement, it has to be sustained public engagement. There's nothing worse than a professional group getting money from the HLF, going and doing archaeology on a, a local population, um, and then saying at the end of that funded period, oh, the money's run out now, sorry, bye, and you're on your own. Um, that has happened. I've been involved in some situations where um, uh, there's been a very bad taste left in the mouth of the public who uh, had to endure that. Um, and we need to think more about how we embed public engagement and the involvement of communities right across what we do. Um, and clearly curators have a role to play in that uh, in the traditional local government sense. Sorry, Rob, not in the museum sense. Um, and the more that we can follow the brilliant work that Norman and his team have been doing in Manchester and trying to make sure that every project at a proportionate level has some degree of engagement and community involvement. That's at least a starting point, and then there are other opportunities that can flow from that as well. That gets over some of those, perhaps, those funding problems. But clearly there are also skills issues, um, and we've been very beneficial in the last few years um, through some funding from HLF and other sources, uh, English Heritage as it was, um, to do a lot of training um, to look at how we get those facilitation skills, those soft skills, how we work with communities. Um, and how they work with us. And I think we've now got a large number of people who've been through a training program in those areas, and we should take advantage as a group of that. And one of the things I think you know, Kate will talk about in a minute is how perhaps we can bring together people who've had these experiences and these opportunities to develop their skills from the volunteer groups as well as from the professions um, to see how we can take that forward together. But one of the barriers, I think, often in these conversations is the language that we use and the way that we define things. And sometimes I think that gets in the way. And we need to perhaps think hard about the language that we're using. When we start talking about professionals or amateurs or volunteers or paid or unpaid, what do we mean by those terms? And sometimes, particularly in the context of CIFA, the, word, the use of the word professional has a particular meaning, which perhaps is not the meaning that other people take it from it, and it can lead, uh, and I've had a number of conversations with people over the last few months thinking that this drive towards professionalism is actually a move to, to rule out unpaid archaeology, and absolutely not. Um, but that's one of the reasons why we're having this conference jointly, CPA and CIFA, to show that we're working very much together to see how everybody can be involved in high quality archaeology. Um, and we all know that there's poor quality archaeology in every sector of archaeology, we're not pointing the finger at uh, community archaeology groups here. We're trying to see how we can work together 
And when it comes to things like training and skills development, there's a lot of that that can again be done together, um, paid, unpaid, whatever terms you want to use, working together to mutual benefit and ultimately to public benefit, which is where a lot of the archaeology is derived from. I think we need to think a little bit more about the scale at which we do some of this partnership working though. And it's interesting that, uh, particularly in the last session, that the, the, the opportunity or the, the potential for the CBA regional groups was, in, was, uh, was mentioned. Obviously we have CBA regional groups in England, um, then there are national groups and we work very closely with Archaeology Scotland uh, in, in Scotland. Um, and I love the fact that people in these sort of situations say, well I think the CBA group should deal with it. Who are the CBA groups? They're all of you. You're the CBA groups, you're members of CBA, I hope. If not, there are membership leaflets on all of your tables. Um, and these are partnership opportunities. The whole point of CBA regional groups, to some extent mirroring the CBA at a UK level, is it brings all the sectors of archaeology, all the segments of archaeology together. They're there are places at a more regional scale, which is sometimes a more appropriate scale to work, where these collaborations can be taken forward. Um, and I think there are opportunities to take, take them forward, um, but all of you need to get involved in that too. Um, collaboration and partnership is clearly the, 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 the mood of the time, as it were. I was grateful to, to Dan for mentioning Heritage 2020, uh, which uh, I've been very heavily involved in trying to push forward in England. There are real opportunities through those sort of frameworks, and we have strategic statements in, uh, in Wales and Scotland, and that enables collaboration in other sorts of ways, perhaps. There are real opportunities, but we have to seize those opportunities, and we have to take them forward. You know, there are going to be tough times ahead with more public sector cuts to come. There's no denying that, but there are still huge opportunities. Kate is now going to tell us what all those opportunities are and how we're going to take advantage of them in the next three years. In about two minutes. Oh, no. <laughs> I think I think probably the main thing that that um, that I've taken from today's discussions really is the need for a vehicle to take things forward, to move things forward. It's been it's been a really interesting day, and the discussions have been have been um, enlightening, uh, challenging in, in some cases. Um, always very interesting. But I think we need to make sure that there's, there's more than just an, an interesting day of discussion. There's something that, that moves forward from this. Um, looking, at my, looking at my notes, so it, there's a lot of scope for bringing together some of the practice um, examples that we've heard about today and others um, that, that people have been talking about um, and that we're aware of. I don't think we're very good at sharing best practice. We're even worse at sharing mistakes. Um, and examples of where things went wrong. We do have, um, we're fortunate to have two, two journals, both published by, by mainly the Historic Environment Policy and Practice Journal and the Community Archaeology Journal, and they're both good vehicles for publishing case studies, um, particularly looking at, um, I suppose, a room full of archaeologists, we all end up talking about archaeology and looking at pictures of archaeology, not about how we planned projects, how we evaluated projects, how, what worked, what didn't, and having those sorts of discussions. So um, I certainly think we need to, to use those journals and, and would encourage all of you who, who have case studies to share to think about publishing them. Um, also looking at, at um, going back to funding, and as Mike was saying, various different sources of funding available, we need to look at, at vehicles for sharing information about, about funding sources um, and how we go about developing projects that meet the requirements of those of those sources. Um, we talked a little bit about regionality um, and about how we need to be very aware of, 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 of one-size-fits-all um, solutions and, and come up with, with guidance and, and policy that's applicable across all the various, not, not just across the regions of, of England and, and the countries of the UK, but across the various different circumstances that, that we all work in. My, one of my particular, um, I suppose, agendas in, in coming here today was to try and, and hopefully reinvigorate our special interest group, which was set up uh, a number of years ago, which for various reasons has, has, has not been as active as it might be. Um, and it strikes me that the group is actually a really good vehicle for sharing these sorts of experiences and for becoming a, a practice network, if you like, for, for, for sharing good practice. 
Um, we've had various discussions about working more closely with CBA and Archaeology Scotland on this, and I think we'd like to see a reinvigorated group go forward as a joint CBA and, and, and CIFA group. Um, and to that end, there is a list downstairs, so if anybody's interested in joining that group, and particularly if you're interested in taking up a, a committee post on that group, please do go and add your name and email contact details to that list. Um, I think a lot of these things that we're talking about could be taken forward through, through the group. Um, and we particularly need, great as it is to meet on these one-off occasions, we particularly need some vehicle for keeping this conversation going throughout the year and to keep, to keep it on the forefront of CFIS agenda. Obviously, it's very much part of the CBA agenda, but to keep, keep that, that issue live, as it were. I think it would be also um, useful and, and something that, that, that we, can, we can try and take forward in discussion with Algeo is to look at um, the public benefit and the extent to which um, local authority curators are able to write in requirements for public benefit and community involvement into their projects. Um, I don't know if that, that feedback exists already, but it would be nice to, to get a feeling for how many, how many local authority curators out there are writing public benefit elements into their briefs and if they're not what they feel the barriers are and what we can do to try and break those down we've seen we've seen the um, the wording in the MPPF and in, in the good practice guide for England um, and how we can start to break down those barriers the other opportunity that that it seems to me is to look at the good practice that that will um, I've no doubt be developed through the major infrastructure projects in HS2. Um, there's a huge opportunity there for community um, archaeology and public archaeology to be built in a standard. I think the challenge for us then as a discipline is how that cascades down from being a one-off exemplar project to um, becoming part of the standard practice um, that, that we all undertake, and particularly for smaller scale projects um, within the development process. <coughs> So I think we need to be thinking now about how, what we need to be doing to do that. I think if we wait in another couple of years down the line, we've, we've missed an opportunity. We need, to, we need to know what it is we want out of that at this stage. And then I think finally, um, looking at the, the current CIFA policy, I think there's a, there's a huge opportunity to revamp that and to, to have a, a collective conversation with CBA and Archaeology Scotland about what we can do to make that more, more of a useful document. Um, and a more thoughtful document um, in the light of, of changing practice. So I think that gives me a bit of a shopping list of things <laughs> to keep me busy over the next few months. Um, in terms of today's discussions, um, I don't know what your time scale is, Doug, for, for, for being able to make these available. Doug's very kindly um, filmed, um, filmed the sessions for us today um, for very limited recompense. Um, so I'm not going to put too much pressure on him in terms of time scale to, to make them available. We will get all this material out onto the CIFA website um, in due course. There's a lot of, of, of notes that I've been collecting from tables. If anybody has notes that they'd like to make available um, from the session, either email or, or, or just leave them on your, on your tables, that would be really useful. And we'll try and draw all this together um, and maybe We'll get it into one of those journals as well as, as onto the website um, in due course. So I think um, I think that's probably all that I wanted to say, other than to thank you all for coming, to thank our speakers and, and uh, discussion facilitators, and the support that we've had from CBA and from Archaeology Scotland, and particularly from the York Archaeological Trust um, in, in providing us with the, not just the venue actually, but the organisational support from Anna Stewart, which has been um, absolutely brilliant um, and we couldn't have done it without her. Um, there is tea and coffee downstairs for those of you who are staying on for the CIFA AGM that will be up here in about five minutes, half an hour? Half an hour, half an hour's time followed by wine at the Yorvik Centre. So thank you all very much for coming um, and that's it.